All right, let's do some random quiz questions while we get started. Um, I promise we talked a little bit about chemistry of chemistry of addiction. Anything neurological, anything related to the brain, we still really don't understand very well. At a, at a really basic level, humanity understands kind of how tolerance, becoming more tolerant of certain chemicals works. Um, and they and we know that certain certain neurotransmitters seem to be tied to um, addictive behavior and addictive personality, um, but we still don't really understand necessarily the full mechanism of how any of that works. Um, yeah, tolerance, like becoming more tolerant to certain chemicals, basically works because your your body's baseline you know, neurotransmitter levels and just biological functions. Um, your body's a pretty well buffered system of equilibrium reactions. And so if you do something like the Chatelier's, um, if, if it's at equilibrium and you change that equilibrium, you'll change that temporarily. But the thing is that, that your body's pretty good at realizing over time, hey, I constantly have this medication. If I want to get back to, to my baseline, which is not necessarily what you want if you're medicating, um, you know, ADHD or something like that. You don't want your body to build up tolerance to the medication, right? But your body basically is just programmed to constantly try to get everything back to the way it normally is. And so what will happen is it'll start pro either producing chemicals that counteract the medication effects, um, or it'll just get more effective at getting rid of the medication faster. In both cases, you wind up with something where medication eventually stops being as effective as your body builds up that tolerance. And that happens to any drug, medication, recreational drugs, alcohol, caffeine, anything like that. If your body gets to the point where it doesn't, where it, you know, even in the case of caffeine, you can get addicted to caffeine because you exactly because your body basically is like, okay, well. We constantly have this level of caffeine, so we're just going to stop producing as much dopamine on our own. And so what happens when you don't have your caffeine the next day is not only are you not at baseline level that you would have if you had your caffeine, you're below baseline level, so you're grumpy. And so you wind up with that, you need it, that's kind of, or from a psychological point of view, um, that's kind of how addiction develops in terms of you need a substance in order to get to your baseline because your body's been working against you, against the medication or the drug, um, trying to keep you at baseline. And all of a sudden when that drug disappears, that can cause really dramatic effects, especially in the cases of opiates, benzos, and alcohol are the three um, drug classes, medication classes where if you have a chemical dependence on that on that drug and you just go cold turkey, the, the chemicals your body is already putting out to try and keep you at baseline can actually kill you. Um, and that's why they, you never wanna go, if you actually have a chemical physical dependence on anything in those three classes of drugs, you have to get medical help. You try to go cold turkey, there is a non-zero chance that you will straight up die from the withdrawals. Um, so don't do that. Um, and in alcohol, it's called delirium tremens. If you've ever heard that term or getting the DTs, shakes. the shakes is one of the, um, one of the things, but it's very similar to the effects of withdrawal, withdrawal from opiates. Um, and I don't know the specific symptoms of benzo withdrawal, but it's very similar to opiates in a lot of ways. And it all comes from those, your body's trying to keep you at baseline. Um, and it, if it's fighting the drugs to keep you at baseline, it's producing something else that can really mess you up if you don't have the drugs in your system. Why does it cause like seizures? So uh, because it's because you're like your body. So I, I don't know the specific mechanisms, but it's all tied to that your body is always putting forward this effort to keep you at what it considers your baseline. And if you if you get too consistent by providing it with the same drugs over and over and over again, it's going to be constantly producing those those counteracting chemicals to keep you at what it considers your baseline. Um, that said, neurology is still really in its infancy. We've only 
only understood what, what DNA was, let alone for like protein pathways. The, the structure of DNA was only figured out that it was double helix, I want to say in the 60s. But so it's been like less than 50 years that humanity as a whole has understood the effect of chemistry and biochemistry on behavior and thought and consciousness. So that field is incredibly young and it's going to, you know, it's, I guarantee you in lectures and answering questions like this, I've said things that would just make me a laughing stock a hundred years from now. A um, hundred years from now, the baseline understanding of neurology is going to be so far advanced from where we are now that it's like, it's like physicists from pre-quantum times trying to talk about what electricity is. You sitting right here already know way more about electricity than, than the physicists from the 1850s. So Newton. Then way more than Newton. Right? Yeah, that guy's old. Um, so obvious. <laughs> also, if you really want to, you really want to hear, read up about Newton in his life story after, he, he had what's called an anno, they refer to it, the Latin term is, um, it translates to miracle year, in you know, mirabilis maybe. Um, Einstein and Newton both had one of these years where they published a, three different groundbreaking, like if Newton was in modern age, would have been worthy of a Nobel Prize three times over in three different areas of physics in one year, um, and then proceeded to go off the deep end. And Einstein didn't go off the deep end, but he definitely like fell off after he had one year published four papers, again, that any one of those four could have won a Nobel Prize. <clears throat> um, and then didn't really, Einstein still contributed, but he did not this at the same level. Um, Newton in particular did go off the deep end. He got super into like Kabbalah and numerology and trying to interpret the book of revelations using math and calculus. Um, and he was he, probably, he was by both. Sounds like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really, like he, he, he became, basically got like a permanent professorship at Oxford in the 1600s. Oxford was the only university really. Um, Oxford and Cambridge in the UK, and he had like this cottage on the grounds that he lived in, and he would come out once a year, um, and nobody saw him other than that. And he was like, you know, he looked like a hermit, bro. like you picture a hermit from the Middle Ages. That's what he would look like after he turned about thirty. He just was weird after that. Um, not to shame for mental illness because he probably did have some sort of mental illness going on, but it's really a trip to read about his life story. Um, and a lot of these bigger scientists that had some, some issues like that. Um, jump down to while we were talking about addiction and mental mental illness, um, we'll talk about alcohol. Do different types of alcohol actually have different effects on people? That depends on what you mean by different types of alcohol. If you mean like methanol versus ethanol versus rubbing alcohol, then absolutely they do. <laughs> Because methanol will make you blind before it kills you. Isopropyl alcohol will just straight up kill you. And um, and ethanol is drinking alcohol. So it'll kill you too, but more slowly. Um, you know, thinking years rather than, or decades rather than minutes in the case, or hours in the case of isopropyl alcohol or methanol. Um, interestingly enough, anything that ends in OL, anything who's, that's chemical name ends in OL is technically an alcohol. Um, the small alcohol molecules, that's the ones we, we were just talking about, um, pretty much they're all, they're all just super toxic to humans with the exception of ethanol that's just a little bit toxic to humans. Um, but stuff like THC is also an alcohol. It's just a much larger molecule that mimics the shape of other neurotransmitters as opposed to messes with your brain in a different way than ethanol does. Um, when it comes to if we're talking about ethanol, all drinking alcohol, like tequila versus whiskey versus vodka, they don't really make a difference other than the fact that cheap booze will tend to have more methanol in it. It doesn't get the methanol pure, um, purified out as well. Or basically, they, they want to, to uh, decrease their cost. So rather than throw out the stuff that has significant amounts of methanol in, they just mix it with the stuff that has less methanol in because then their bottom line gets better. Um, and that's why if you drink really, really bad hard liquor, you will have a much worse hangover the next day because it's actually the methanol still left over in trace amounts that gives you the worst hangover usually. Um, 
So it's worth spending $20 a bottle on vodka and not buying plastic handle vodka. Take it from someone who knows. I know that not because of the chemistry, but because I was a grad student. Um, and that's that's something that the chemical engineers, we spend a significant amount of time workshopping and doing tests on what was the most effective bang for your buck because we had no money um, and we need, needed to drink significant amounts because we were grad students. Um, and it was not particularly healthy, but we did. Yeah, there was a there was a place there was a there was an undergrad bar or like a fancy bar that did all you can drink wine for two hours on Fridays. Um, it was it was decent wine too, and you had to buy one small plate, and the cheapest small plate was like five bucks, and then you paid eight dollars for your first glass of wine, and then you could drink the rest of the wine. And so we were always done by nine o'clock on a Friday night because you know two and a half bottles of wine in two hours will do that on an empty stomach. Um, <laughs> That was the other key. The other key was don't eat food before you go out drinking. Otherwise, you spend too much money. You go on an empty stomach, get the cheap buzz, and then you get street food on your way home. I don't recommend doing any of that, especially if you're not 21. Don't do any of that. Yeah, Alexis. What? <laughs> um, somebody asked about light induced molecular, molecule vibration therapy. Could it be a cure for cancer? I mean, it certainly could be. I don't, there's no evidence to suggest it is. Um, anytime somebody is trying to convince you something is a cure for anything, if they're also trying to sell you that, you should be very, very wary, and you can mostly dismiss it. Until it's been published in peer-reviewed journal articles, don't trust anybody who's trying to sell you something and making claims like that. It's mostly just BS. Um, it's, you know, in the old days, they would have called it snake oil, modern time we call it, uh, pseudoscience, which basically just means you dress up something that's BS with some scientific words, scientific sounding words, um, and then use it to sell a product. Um, one of the biggest, most widespread in the U S examples of this is actually chiropractic care. Um, chiropractic care has zero peer reviewed journal evidence to suggest it has any effect on anything um, other than one journal article published in like the 1920s um, that was funded by the Chiropractic Association um, that suggests that it may have some effect on long-term lower back pain. But anything beyond that is totally, like maybe it does, maybe it has a positive effect, but there's been no research to suggest that it does. Any claims they're making are they're just making up. Um, the other one that's really common, has anybody heard of that book, The Secret? Yeah, it. yeah it's uses, it's basically a whole lot of, um, well, using scientific sounding words that don't mean anything in the context. You say the word quantum and throw it in front of quantum manifestation and try to say that that just means you have to think about it real hard and it'll happen. Um, that's not really scientific. It just uses scientific words. And I don't mean to come off as dismissive, but there's a, I feel kind of strongly when people try to misrepresent science um, as saying things it doesn't, uh, especially when they're just trying to sell you something um, that bothers me. So if you want more about that, there's, uh, there's actually a really fun, well, fun for me anyway, um, website that got probably got linked in your skepticism in science assignment. Um, there's the periodic, did you guys, I'll show you this one, periodic table of irrational nonsense. Yeah. Pretty fun. It is. And especially if you go through the actual, um, the actual website rather than just the link, it actually has like links to all this stuff, the interactive version. Well, we didn't show us that. Um, it just gives you like a brief explanation of what each of these terms means and fairly, again, fairly, um, I'll just do this today. Honestly, right? Um, so much more interesting. And it has links to, is one um, of these chiropractic? One of them is chiropractic, yeah. Uh, it, under the, it's in the quack CP. Spot. CP, where is it? 59 CP right down there on the left on the lower left. 
over here. Keep going down. Keep going down. All the way. Oh, yeah. Over to the right there. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's worth spending some time looking at some of this stuff. It's also worth looking at some of the history, just like reading about um, uh, Newton's life, um, reading about the early origins of chiropractic care. It's a whole lot of um, basically taking taking ideas from Eastern religions, like like centering your chakras in dressing it up in Western medical terms. So they say things like it's there, we're gonna do a subluxation and that's going to allow your energy flow to improve when they really mean we're gonna align your heart chakra or something like that. Um, it's basically the exact same approaches. Um, and it's, it's kind of weird, like all, if you look up the beliefs that they teach still to this day at chiropractic colleges, um, it's really interesting and eye-opening. I grew up going to chiropractors and it was like, kind of, it took me a while to like, what, what's going on here? <laughs> I guess I've never looked into like the reasoning behind why chiropractic works because I don't really believe it in like a scientific way. All I know is like my ribs can not pain and the chiropractor can get the back in <laughs> And it, it, it does feel good too. Like yeah. it, it gets that you get that really satisfying crunch in your your neck or in your back, and it feels great. Um, there's just no evidence that it has any long term benefits. Okay, so it's a long. -term. Yeah, and and none of it. Yeah, nobody's gonna say it doesn't feel good. Or, um, but again, there's just not been any research. And part of that is because it's hard to design a double blind study with chiropractic care, right? Because you know whether somebody pushed on your back and popped your your joints, right? It's hard to do a double blind study where the pr practitioners and the person, um, you know, both don't know whether or not they're in the control group or not. So part of it's just a limitation of that. Um, the other thing that is interesting is the, and again, I'm going to go into anecdotal my experience. In general, I don't think chiropractors do anything that a good physical therapist can't do. And the physical therapist usually teaches you exercises and things you can do on your own to keep yourself more healthy. And the chiropractors, again, in my experience, for the most part, just keep you coming back every two weeks, um, as opposed to teaching you those exercises to make yourself self-sufficient. Um, your mileage may vary, obviously, to that. A good chiropractor and a good physical therapist are probably going to do about the same thing for most most injuries um, and tell you the same stuff. But again, be wary of somebody trying to sell you something um, like chiropractic care if they don't have if there hasn't been independently verified by somebody who doesn't have a horse in the race. You know what I mean? Um, We've spent enough time on random stuff, so we'll save semiconductors. Sorry. Um, Costa asked the question, he's not in here anyway, so we'll save it for when he's back anyway. Um, relevant questions, and again, this is just the first half of the alphabet because in the hour since you last saw me, I haven't gotten through all the quiz questions. Um, why is it important to know exact cell potential and measure potential energy? Can we give some examples of real life application? Anybody who's going into anything engineering related needs to understand at some level how batteries work, right? And yet it might, you might spend more time in your, in your actual career if you go into engineering. You might spend more time designing circuits from the physics point of view, but knowing how batteries work and how to optimize batteries is a really valuable skill, um, at least at a conceptual level. You know, I don't want, I don't want a mechanical engineer designing a car if they don't know how a battery works. Um, yeah, the battery doesn't place that isn't that big of a role in the car operation, but at the same time, you know, you kind of have to understand some fundamental aspects of it. Um, so will you actually use these exact calculations? Maybe, maybe not. But understanding the underpinnings and where things fall apart is really important for anything engineering related. Um, and most STEM fields have some elements of problem solving and engineering and optimizing, even if you're not an engineer by trade. Um, 
What are ways to make a cell potential increase besides the concentration? Uh, again, this is something that you'll spend more time on in physics, but basically you can put them in a series. Put a bunch of them, you have a whole bunch of one volt batteries and you put them all in a row, you put five one volt batteries in a row, you actually get a five volt difference between the front and back um, when it comes to driving that current. So basically playing around with parallel versus series and how many batteries you have can basically allow you to tailor your cell potential to exactly what your circuit needs. Um, somebody asked about a potato battery. That's a, a bit of a misnomer. Potato batteries, does everybody know what I'm talking about with potato batteries? Have you seen that science fair project? I've turned a, batter, a potato into a battery. It's actually not the potato that's the battery. It's actually the potato is just a salt bridge that you actually, the pieces of metal you plug into the potato that you stab into it and attach the alligator clips to are electrodes. Usually one's zinc and one's copper. Sound familiar? That's just another way of doing that. They just don't have those ions built into it. And I guess where you could say that the, the um, energy is coming from the potato a little bit is that the copper ions that are naturally found in potatoes um, are what are being reduced on the anode side, cathode side, sorry. Um, and so you could say that some of the energy is coming from the potato in that respect, but basically it's just the potato is just a salt bridge um, and source of some of the ions. Um, so in that respect, it's a voltaic cell, although you could use it as a salt bridge for an um, electrolytic cell if you, I don't know. I guess I don't know how you would do that. Cut a potato in half and then put a, vol a um, voltage source in between the two halves, perhaps. Um, you could get it to go backwards, but I'm not sure. Um, and then last but not least, somebody asked about, are we going to be doing reaction rates with the lab on Tuesday? We did not do reaction rates with this lab, right? We just looked at, here's your total amount of hydrogen. But turns out the reaction rate would have been a good thing to pay attention to because some of those power sources worked a lot better than others, right? And it wasn't really the power sources we figured out. It was the electrodes. The better you cleaned off the electrode and got rid of the oxidation on the electrode, the faster the reaction went. Um, and Lucas, you were in the group that finished first, right? Yeah, I, think we, I got the first one, so I got the penis one. So it just worked out. And you, you just got the cleanest one because you grabbed it first? Yeah, I ended okay. it like good, like five seconds. So sometimes luck plays a role when it comes to how do we get out of the lab fastest. Um, it's sometimes it's hard to tell what's going to be that issue because we thought it was the voltage sources too. We even switched out the voltage source with me and it didn't make a difference. It was just Lucas being, being lucky. The manifesting one. Lucky. Yes. <laughs> oh, exactly. Uh, <laughs> It's becoming, it's become a, there's that commercial about the, yes, no, about the influencer who goes to the, I just found this lake and recording her Insta and yeah, yeah. like, just out here practicing gratitude, manifesting abundance. It's become a thing my family says to each other, just manifesting abundance. <laughs> You're manifesting lunch. I like that. Um, all right. How would we record the reaction rate? Would this be an observation bait or would this be observation? We were just looking at beginning and end. So we didn't look at rates. How would we record the rate? We're going to talk about that today. There's a lot of ways we can do that in next week's lab. Next week's lab has a fair bit of reading and pre-lab stuff. So we're going to do the lab on Wednesday, Thursday of next week. Um, and on Monday and Tuesday is, is your chance to finish up your research project proposal, but also to start working on that, um, the pre-lab and reading through the background, because turns out measuring rates is kind of a tricky thing to do, um, especially in practical terms. If I give you, we'll go back here in a second. Um, if I give you a chart like this, it says average rate in molarity per second, or just says, here's your concentration before and after, Finding the rate's really easy, right? But measuring the concentration is a non-trivial matter for a lot of reactions. How do we actually measure a concentration other than just weighing something out and solving it in water using molecular weight? Well, turns out that is a tricky thing to measure. 
And so that is something we're going to work on next week. And we'll do see some examples of ways we can measure things directly. Um, but it is a tricky issue. All right. And then I have, there's enough reaction or uh, questions about the quiz questions as well. Um, that here we go through these, um, at least some of these. If we're going to try and calculate cell potential, we need to know what's going to be uh, what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. So it's most basic. How can we tell what's being oxidized and what's being reduced here? What's gaining electrons? What's losing electrons? Right. So if it's gaining electrons. then the charge must be going down, right? Is there anything we can look at in this reaction, look at it right away and say it's not being oxidized or reduced? Yes. The sulfur, the sulfide, to be more precise, right? It's a minus two charge here. We don't know what its charge is over here, but we can, we can guess it's still part of an ionic compound. And sulfur, when it's sulfide, when it's part of an ionic compound, is going to be a minus two. Just look at the periodic table, right? So then, if the sulfur, if the sulfide is still a minus two over here, what's the charge on the mercury? Plus two. Plus two, and it started at zero. So is that oxidation or reduction? Oxidation. Losing electrons is oxidation. The other thing you can think about that helps, that sometimes helps me with, with um, figuring out it's oxidation. Oxidation is what happens to metal when you just leave it out in oxygen, right? When you leave metal out, it rusts. Metal, if you start from a metal and then it reacts to get a positive charge, that's oxidation. And so I just use the real world, like, okay, I know that metal as a metal with zero charge will turn into a plus charge if I leave it out. And what do we call that? We call that it being oxidized. So, or you can remember your oil rig or Leo says Kerr. All of those are valid ways of remembering it. I mean, if we start with a metal that's already got a charge and we make a metal, that's gonna be the opposite process, right? So we're making silver metal, from silver ions to start at plus one. So that's our reduction. There's our oxidation. Um, what reaction is happening at the anode? At the anode is negatively charged which means, is it attracting electrons or pushing electrons? Pushing. pushing electrons. So your anode is losing electrons. Oxidation. That means it's oxidation. Oxidation is happening at the anode. So that's the our mercury. <laughs> that reaction is happening at the anode. And then that means that the other reaction, the silver reaction, is what's happening at the cathode. Cathodes are positively charged, so they're pulling electrons towards them. So reductions happen at the cathode. What compound is the reducing agent and the oxidizing agent? So the reducing agent means it's not being reduced, it's doing the reducing to something else. So the reducing agent is what's being oxidized. So the mercury is the reducing agent. I read something that um, like the standard cell potential is like the lower one is always a reducing agent or what? Something like so, that. So that all comes from the if it's a spontaneous reaction, it needs to have a positive cell potential. Right. So you can make, I don't like to make general generalizations like that because that's kind of getting around what's really happening. If you 
think of it as we need to keep the cell potential positive, then you're right. Whatever has the lower cell, half cell potential is the one that's going to get flipped around and be the oxidation, right? And another way of saying that is, is that will always be the reducing agent because it's being oxidized. Um, it seemed, if you, if you remember it as rules like that, if it helps you understand it by all means, it's one of those things that seems like that's another rule to memorize. And I'm not good at rules, memorizing rules. I'm good at understanding a few rules and applying them to everything um, because that's just how my brain works, how my, my early science teachers taught me to think about stuff. Um, but if having a list of generalizations is helpful for you, go for it. It's not wrong to think about it that way. It's just sort of ignoring what happens in between to just say, this and that, and don't worry about the middle part. What's the oxidizing agent? Well, if it's the mercury is the reducing agent, we have two choices left, sulfur or the silver. 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 Because if the sulfide is not being oxidized, or reduced, it's not really part of the redox reaction. It's balanced because you wind up making it precipitate. But other than that, the sulfide is not really doing anything. So it's the silver, and specifically, it's the silver ions. That are the reducing agent. The silver metal, anything on the product side is not a reducing agent or an oxidizing agent. It's the it's the result of the redox reaction. And it needs to be there to be balanced, but it's not the reducing agent or the oxidizing agent. The oxidizing agent and the reducing agent have to be reactants by definition. Question on this one. I think I think everybody did pretty well at using the half reactions. If you have the half reactions, finding the voltage is pretty straightforward, right? Flip the one around so that you're going to wind up with a positive voltage. Or in this case, since we already had it defined as reactants and products, you flip around the one that's being oxidized and then flip the sign on the cell potential and just add them together. Do we practice a half reaction method one? How do we feel about this one? If I just give it like this, I say voltaic cell is made half two half cells, and it tells you what the half cells are even. So we have bromine being reduced. and turning into bromide. And we have a separate reaction. Aluminum metal is oxidized. We didn't really even need to get that Um, even balancing this was not too tricky, right? We didn't need to mess up with, with waters or H pluses or hydroxides, anything like that. Our balance reaction just like looks like this. What's the only thing that's left to balance on both of these? Electrons. Just our electrons, right? So we've got a minus two charge on one side here. Remember, we balance charge by adding electrons, which means we're trying to bring either side to the whatever is lowest. We have a minus two and a zero. We can't bring a minus two up to zero by adding electrons on this side, right? So we have to bring our zero to minus two. So two electrons plus bromine turns into two bromides. On the flip side, we have a zero and a plus three. So 
we're just gonna add three electrons. And when we wanna add these two reactions together, so we need to make sure these cancel out. So we're gonna multiply the bottom one by two, give us a total of six electrons in the top reaction by three to give us six electrons. And then just add everything together. So that's gonna give us three. I don't remember the order that it was written on the on the test, but it doesn't really matter. Just make sure you're keeping track of, of your I think the most common mistake I saw on this one was mixing up the order um, and putting six aluminums and two bromides instead of the other way around, um, which is reasonable. Just pay, be paying attention when you're writing this out. Plus two aluminum reacts to give us six bromides and two. Al three plus. So that part, I think everybody got pretty well, right? Everybody, at least for the most part, got to the right coefficients, even if you mix up the six and the two on the second half. If we're given initial concentrations, calculate the cell potential at zero Celsius. That's when we're going to have to find that Nernst equation, right? And that one is cell potential is equal to standard cell potential. And I always mess up. I always have to check my equation sheet on this one because I don't do the electrochemistry as often. I believe it's a minus RT, RT over NF. LN. LN, LN, if we're doing the blown up version, right? LN of Q. So constant given, what is N for this one? Six. 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 No moles of electrons that we canceled out, right? So since we had a three here and a two there, the ones that actually canceled out, N would be six. So make sure you're using the right R value, the one that's in joules per mole, um, 8.314. And then Faraday's constant's a constant. 9.6 times 10 to the fourth. Joules per coulomb or coulombs per joule or whatever it is. Whatever makes it cancel out, which would be joules per coulomb. So that the joules from R cancel out with the joules in F. Um, and then Q is just products of reactants, right? But anything that's solid gets left out. Third rule of equilibrium. <laughs> right, and it should have come out to be something like 2.8, I believe. Um, depending on where you, how many sig figs you carried on your Faraday's constant or what value you looked up, some people got like, um, got something closer to two than 2.8. Um, you know, uh, knowing that this is the right equation is most of it, right? And knowing what all the variables are. If you messed up your rounding somewhere, um, actually, probably, I should probably run the numbers. I bet it was mixing up natural log for log. Is probably what threw off most of those numbers. I got the same wrong number several times in a row, um, which tells me that it's it's a similar the same mistake. And again, that's the most likely place to mess up on this one is to use log base ten instead of natural log. So just pay attention. This is the form that's on the equation sheet. That voltaic cell lab that has the condensed version of the 0.05. Um, and then they switch natural log for log base 10. I don't like that version because I don't want to memorize an extra number. I already have enough trouble memorizing these numbers. Lucas, so we just pull the standard cell potential from the appendix. Exactly. Exactly. It's written so, this way. So you already know what's being produced and what's being oxidized. So find your standard cell potential just from the appendix. Um, if I was asking this on a test, on an in-class test, I would give you the cell potentials, or I would just print out a, to the table that's in the back of the book um, and put that up in with your equation sheet at the end of the test. Any other 
issues that we might run into here that you didn't know how to deal with. One other pitfall. We all know enough at this point that keep everything in Kelvin, right? Celsius is great for measuring stuff in lab, but when we're actually doing calculations, just put all of your temperatures in Kelvin. Um, and if you're paying attention to your units on R, R has a Kelvin in it. So that should be a reminder that make sure you put that zero Celsius into Kelvin. Um, but that, that's another you know, common pitfall. Any other questions about the quiz? All right, then let's do a few minutes of rate of kinetics. So kinetics is the is the sciency sounding name for rates. Rates applies to a lot of things. Kinetics specifically means how fast are the rates of a chemical reaction. So when I say the word kinetics and rates, I mean the same thing. They're interchangeable as far as I'm concerned. Um, I just don't want anybody confused about that. We talked about this slide the other day, and we talked about how your instantaneous rate changes based on concentration, right? We ended with defining what a rate law was, kind of, right? We said, well, we don't necessarily know what the co or what the exponents are, but in general, a rate is always going to be equal to a constant times some concentrations. So in this case, our two reactants are hydrogen gas and iodine. Right? And we don't know what X and Y are necessarily. But we do know that this reaction rate is changing as these concentrations change. That tells us that these two concentrations wind up being significant. At the very least, we know that X and Y both are not both zero. What would happen if X and Y were both zero? They'd both be one, right? And what does that do to your rate? It's a constant. Your rate would be a constant, right? Or in other words, this red line, this red line is plotted in concentration of product, right? If the rate's a constant, that means you're forming product at a constant rate. In other words, you have a constant slope here. We know that that's not the case. So we know that X and Y can't both be zero. So how do we actually figure out what they are? Well, we've got some trick, some tricks that we can do. Um, but in general, the more you increase concentration of reactants, the faster reaction is going to go. Zero order reactions are actually pretty rare. Almost nothing is actually a zero order reaction like that with a constant rate. Um, mostly because everything depends on stuff running into each other. So this is the same reaction happening twice. Ever, anybody ever burn steel wool? It lights on fire, does an okay job. All that is, is the oxidation of the iron in steel wool happening really quickly. You heat it up, it oxidizes, in the presence of oxygen, it, it oxidizes faster. If you have paint thinner in it, it goes a little quicker. It goes even faster if you have paint thinner, but you're adding another reaction then, right? And the other way you can do it though, is if you start by lighting it on fire and then you put it into a beaker that has and that's enriched in terms of its concentration of oxygen, it burns really fast. Because that the whole point or the whole process of oxygen with sufficient speed runs into iron that has sufficient energy, and then you wind up with them oxidizing and reducing happens much, much quicker if you have more oxygen around. How come, could we take those uh, electrodes that we were using today, the iron ones? If we took those and we hold them over a Bunsen burner, would they burn? Why not? Because those are so... That's too much. 
Disturbance theory is a lot smaller in the case of those ingots, those little electrodes, than it is here. They would still rust eventually, but it wouldn't burn the way we see this happening, right? Because you still need to have enough surface area because that's where your oxygen atoms have to come hit the surface in order to react. More surface area is going to speed things up too. It has similar effect as increasing concentrations. Um, in fact, relatively harmless stuff can be used as rocket fuel. Powdered aluminum, the earliest dry fuel cell or dry cell rocket boosters were basically just powdered aluminum in a source of oxygen. Um, and you put the powdered aluminum with the source of oxygen and then you hit ignite and it just burns and produces a ton of gas as a byproduct and a ton of heat as a byproduct. Um, all it is is powdered aluminum. It's the same aluminum that you have as aluminum foil under your sink or wherever you keep your aluminum foil. Um, the only difference is the form, is how much surface area there is. Also, the same thing that's happening with, is anybody uh, in the kitchen that had a that had a flour pitch fire? And that if you have a lot of flour in the air, there's a lot of particles of flour in the air, and you have an open flame, you can actually ignite and cause an explosion. I think they do this in one of the Ant-Man movies, maybe. I think he throws like a thing of, of uh, flour at somebody in the kitchen, um, and it and he like superhuman punches it and, it, and it blows up into a big cloud of flour that then catches fire and explodes. Um, that's a real thing. It's what causes grain silos to explode, too. Basically, all it is is just oxidizing all that carbon that's in those that's in those um, molecules, but with enough surface area, it happens real fast. There's a there's a great like banana explosion story in the strip district in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, from like 1904 or whatever. This is a real, not an urban legend. This is a real a banana exploding. Yeah, but yeah, like the the warehouse where they kept bananas and like like the promotion of gas or whatever. Um, that was probably ethylene. Yeah. So fruit, as they get, as fruit ripens, most plants produce the same, it's a it's a hormone for plants yeah. that, that causes plants to, or fruit to ripen. Um, and they can be produced at pretty significant quantities and it burns really well. Yeah. It's in between natural gas and acetylene is ethylene. Um, it's also why if you have an underripe avocado, if you put it in a bag with a banana, in a, just a paper bag, and, and for about an hour or two, um, that, that's enough to ripen up the avocado to make it useful. Good kitchen hack. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They say to put like certain vegetables in your refrigerator together in drawers, because if you put certain ones together, it'll go bad. Everybody's heard the phrase, uh, don't let one bad apple ruin the whole barrel. That's because apples actually, one rotting apple will cause all of the apples it's touching to rot as well. Even if they're not nearly close to ripe, they will start rotting and falling apart because of these plant hormones. Um, the most common of which is ethylene, um, which is also how they get tomatoes to ripen. They harvest tomatoes. Yeah. Tomatoes that you buy from the grocery store um, are green when they're shipped. Because they don't bruise as easily when they're green. And then when they get to the grocery store, they expose them to ethylene, and that causes them to ripen up and turn turn red. Um, what about uh, molasses, severed molasses has exploded? That's probably more the refining process. There was the molasses flood, and was it in Boston? Yeah. So the molasses flood, and I think that was a, re a molasses refinery that had, they caught fire, and then a giant vat of molasses <laughs> ruptured, and they actually flooded all those streets. So people died, drowned in molasses. <laughs> <laughs> you get stuck in the molasses. It sounds like it's not a real thing, but that was a real historical event. You could look up the molasses flood of 18 whatever. <laughs> All right, let's let's talk about one more factor about rates. One more thing that affects rates. We can tie this to real world situations as well. Um, we can find exact sentence. Temperature is also going to affect how fast a reaction happens, which is why. Iron, you know, steel wool will still rust if you just leave it out at room temperature. 
but you hold it over a Bunsen burner and it catches flame and burns, oxidizes all at once. The temperature aspect really affects rate as well because at higher temperatures, temperature is just another way of saying the, the kinetic energy of a molecule, right? They were basically measuring the kinetic energy of a molecule when we're measuring temperature. Um, the way mathematically we represent it is kinetic energy is proportional to temperature, but the average kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. Proportional just means that when you double one, you double the other. You double the temperature in Kelvin, you double the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So if you double the speed of the molecule, or the and it's not it's not the same as saying doubling the speed. Because where are my physics people? What's the equation for the classical equation for kinetic energy? One half mv squared. So temperature is not proportional to velocity of the molecules. It's proportional to the kinetic energy, which means there's a square root term in there if we wanted to actually solve for velocity of the molecules. But we can do that. We can take the same approach and apply it and just say, well, the average rate or the average speed of a molecule is this at this temperature. For the most part, though, we don't really care the actual speed of the molecules. We care about how fast the reaction happens, right? Um, and that, we just look at this relationship. If your kinetic energy doubles when your temperature doubles, that means your rate's going to happen a lot faster, too. And it's a really interesting function. Because if you look at really small temperatures in terms of kinetic energy, you get this, this um, if we were just measuring, I just made up a chemical reaction so I could make these graphs. Um, but at low temperatures, when you start increasing the temperature, the rate's not, the rate of the reaction is not doubling when we double the temperature. The kinetic energy of the molecules is doubling. But the rate has this more complicated shape to it. I'm standing too close to the to the uh, whiteboard there. Um, as and as the temperature starts going up, we do get into sort of this. It's not quite exponential growth, but it's not a straight line either, because we had this low area down here. If it was exponential growth. We'd expect it to continue going exponential, not hit this sort of like somewhat linear phase. And if we zoom out even further, if we look at what happened to higher temperatures, it sort of levels off as you get to higher temperatures. And all of this is because what's actually happening is goes through is this process that we call transition state theory. This is explained by the fact that we need our average our our molecules have to have enough kinetic energy to basically make it over a barrier. I used the analogy last week of if I threw a, a bouncy ball, doesn't matter how hard I throw it, me personally, I'm never going to be able to throw it over Spooner Summit. Right? You need Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite. I bet I could throw a football over those mountains. <laughs> um, but in theory, you need to give something enough speed that it can make it over a barrier. It doesn't matter that the, the balancing ball would have less energy, would be more stable in Sacramento than here. If you can't get it out of the basin, then it doesn't matter. That reaction will never happen. Or maybe, maybe I start experimenting, maybe one time out of a million that I try to throw a Super Bowl, I actually manage to launch it over, over Echo Summit. Maybe the reaction happens one time out of a million. Well, if you start increasing the speed of the bouncy ball in other ways, we can make maybe make that one out of every 5,000 times instead of one out of every million. The rate is going to increase when that happens, right? The rate of the bouncy ball getting to Sacramento is going to increase if we increase the speed of the bouncy ball. Right? And so this barrier, we call that the transition state. Because basically it's in between reactants and products. And it doesn't matter whether the reaction is spontaneous or not. If delta G, if it goes downhill in energy, so that delta G 
is less than zero, that means the reaction is spontaneous in chemistry terms. It doesn't mean the reaction is going to happen in any sort of measurable rate. Because what we still need to do is to get over that barrier, that transition state barrier. All right, and, and graphically, the way we represent a transition state is with this symbol um, called, it's uh, an old typographical symbol. We usually just draw it like that, like, like a lowercase t that you cross twice. Um, it, interestingly, if you actually go to a Times New Roman or an old, old timey looking font, the double dagger character, it's sorry, it's called double dagger because it literally looks like two swords pointing at each other. It looks like with a little dot for the handle and then the same thing at the top. That's a pain to draw though. So we just you draw it like that. What that means though, and the reason they chose that as the symbol is you tried to you tried to balance, and I actually just made this connection, caught this, I don't know how many times I just made this connection. You tried to balance two daggers on top of each other. That's not going to be very stable, right? You put them point to point and try to make it balance. It's not going to ever stay no matter what you do, right? It's a lot like getting to the tra this transition state. If you picture putting a ball on top of this transition state, is it going to stay there? Now, this is a true local maximum in calculus terms. It's going to immediately roll one way or the other, right? Transition states inherently are unstable. It's always at the peak of something. And so it'll whatever you put there, if you make it to that point, if you have that much energy, it's immediately going to fall one way or the other. And so what we really need for a reaction to happen is to have enough energy you can make it there. And then statistics is going to take 50% of the time to roll either way once you get there. But having a significant number of molecules with enough kinetic energy to make it there, or rather what percentage of the molecules have enough energy to make it there, is based on the temperature. What are the blue and red ones? Okay. Just two different reactions. One that's with that's endothermic and one that's exothermic, but they both could have the same transition state energy. And we're calling right side is spontaneous, left side is non? So the blue one is spontaneous and the red one is not. I think left side is the reaction. Left side is react. Sorry, reaction coordinate just means reactants moving towards products. So here's our reactants that are the same for both reactions. Got it. And they're making two different sets of products. One that's downhill in energy is spontaneous. One that's uphill in energy, the delta G is greater than zero. Got it. I see. But they can both have the same transition state energy. They could both, in theory, have the same rate. Their equilibrium constants are going to be different. But their rates could be the same if they have the same transition state energy and they start at the same time, which is a little bit weird. So I'm, part of the point here is I'm trying to remind us we're, that kinetics, rates, is independent of thermodynamics, it's independent of equilibrium. They have some similarities, but just because something is downhill in energy doesn't mean that it has a low activation energy, the low transition state energy. And just because something is uphill in energy doesn't mean that it's slow. Right? We have two different variables, the transition state energy and then delta G for the whole reaction. I should just say reaction here. Delta G for the reaction is just final minus initial. Delta G for the transition state is this number. All right, let's let that sink in and we'll talk about Boltzmann this constant when we get back and how temperature affects that. So let's come back at 10 after. <laughs> Uh, I'm just talking about
But uh, yeah, we go to we go to a lot of Aces games with Bruce. Uh, my kids know his his youngest is twenty two now, and and is like honorary honorary uncle to our to our kids. They they love. They call him baseball Bruce, or they did when they were little. That is just Bruce. But Bruce, you mean we're gonna go see baseball Bruce? Yeah, we're gonna go see baseball Bruce. Um, all right. So we were talking about transition state theory and how a molecule needs enough energy to make it over that barrier. The problem with that is that we have to get statistics involved because not every molecule is traveling the same speed. I must have erased it, but no, this equation, that average piece right there means we're not really talking about all molecules being the same speed, which makes sense, right? Picture a moving box, a big two foot by two foot by two foot moving box with 200 ping pong balls in it. You pick it up and shake it, are all the ping pong balls moving the same speed? No, you're going to have some moving faster than others, some randomly bump into each other and take off twice as fast, and some are moving next to no speed, right? And so that's the trick with this. The reason it's such a complicated function is because we're really looking at the whole picture, the whole statistical ensemble um, when it comes to this. And so the, and I think I've talked about this function before, the Boltzmann distribution um, is basically, it's the same as, it's similar to a Gaussian distribution, to a bell curve. Um, but the difference is in, and basically the, the height here, the y-axis is just how many molecules have a certain energy. So, and this is velocity on the, on the um, y-axis and number of molecules, sorry, velocity on the x-axis and number of molecules on the y-axis. At different temperatures, these are different temperatures in Celsius. You have a different distribution. It's the same shape for all of them. The function is the same for this. And it's, like I said, it's a lot like a bell curve, except it's skewed right. Um, and why does this make sense that it's not quite the same as a true bell curve? We might expect that it's a true bell curve if it's truly random distribution. Why isn't a true bell curve though? What physical reason was that? It starts at some zero. It's got to start at zero. Can you have something with a negative speed? If a molecule is moving, it's got a it's got a positive kinetic energy, right? And if molecule's dead still, it has zero kinetic energy but it can never have negative kinetic energy, right? Remember that velocity squared term. So it doesn't matter whether it's moving right or left or up or down, you know, up or down might have a positive velocity versus a negative velocity. But once you square it, you get a positive number out of the velocity, right? So no matter what you do, you can't have anything over here. So basically this is this function, this Boltzmann distribution is basically a bell curve where nothing, it's not infinite to, toward the left. It's limited, and so you have this shape instead, and that's why they always start at zero. Because you can't have anything that left that, and there's always some molecule, some tiny amount of molecules that are going zero meters per second. Right? And, but what happens is as you increase the temperature, you don't shift the whole function to the right, you flatten it out. You basically, if you picture taking this, this is being held here in place. If you picture just a piece of string with this shape laying on the ground, picture grabbing this end and pulling it this way. It's gonna flatten the whole thing down at higher temperatures 
you basically have a wider distribution of speeds. You still have the same minimum, but that's going to change your average, right? Your average kinetic energy is going to go up when temperature goes up because you're dragging this whole thing to the right or stretching it out to the right. It's a better way to say or skewing to use the statistical term. And for each of these, the, the average kinetic energy is not exactly where the peak is. It's a little bit to the right of the peak because it does extend out infinitely to the right. You know, you can see it falls off really closely, gets close to zero. But technically, there's a finite probability that one at the red temperature, you've got a molecule, one molecule that's all the way out here in terms of velocity, right? It's a small probability, but there's a it is a real probability. And so it extends infinitely that way. And so you don't wind up with the average being right at the top. And basically, it's just where you, these are all usually just normalized. Again, use a statistics term so that the area under the curve for each of these is one. And so really, if you look at the um, where the average is, it's where half the molecules are going slower and half the molecules are going faster. Well, now let's add the idea that, okay, in order for a reaction to happen, some specific reaction, molecule, two molecules that have to run into each other have to run into each other with at least 750 meters per second, which is where this black line is. What percent of the molecules, is it going to be a big percentage of the molecules if we're at the red line, if we're at minus 100 Celsius? not very many of the molecules. Now, if you look at the total area of that shape, that's maybe, I don't know, maybe 3% of that area is above the, is to the right of that black line. When you change the temperature and go from minus 100 Celsius to 20 Celsius, and we're looking at the green one now, it's still less than half of the molecules but a lot larger percentage of the molecules have enough energy to make it up, up over that barrier. So would we expect the green line to be, for the rate, rate to be faster or slower? Faster. If more molecules have enough energy, go back to the ping pong balls in the, in the moving box. If let's say that a ping pong ball popping out of the moving box, means a reaction happened. If I'm shaking them slowly, there's a chance that one or two will pop out, right? Maybe one or two per minute. If I'm sitting there like this with a big moving box of big pong balls. If I start doing this, if I increase the average speed of the ping pong balls, a lot more of them per minute are going to pop out of the box, right? So a larger percentage of the of the molecules having enough energy means the rate is bigger, means the reaction happens faster. And then last but not least, we look at the blue one at 600 Celsius. That's a, that's close to 50% of the molecules have enough energy that as long as they happen to bump into the right other molecule, they have enough energy that it'll react. And so this is why that function, that um, rate versus temperature function is such a complicated function, because when we're down here, this correlates with less than 1% of your molecules have enough energy. And then as you start going up, now we're starting getting into a measurable percentage have enough energy for the reaction to happen. But eventually, we keep flattening that function out, it'll plateau. Or zoom out way further, we get this wonky looking shape. It doesn't look like any sort of function that you've seen necessarily, where it'll basically, eventually it'll plateau off. Eventually, 99% of the molecules will have enough energy to make it over that barrier. And increasing the temperature, go from 99 to 99.1, 
is not going to dramatically affect the rate. Right, so it's not quite exponential growth. There's areas that kind of look like exponential growth. There's areas that look like it's it's kind of proportional, where it looks like it's kind of a straight line. Then there's areas where it looks like it doesn't matter what the temperature does. Right, and this is because of the shape of that Boltzmann distribution. That function um, has a specific mathematical form to it, and it looks like something we've seen before. That um, remember the equation for equilibrium constant was e to the minus delta g of reaction over RT. That looks familiar, right? Turns out this function is the Boltzmann distribution. So equilibrium constants are a result of, of that statistics that go into this with process they call statistical thermodynamics. Which incidentally, the one class that I ever had to repeat in all my years of academia, to I had to take StatMet twice. Um, not because it is very complicated, but mainly because I was stupid and I turned in somebody else's figure to go along with my code um, because I didn't have time to let the simulation run. <laughs> I did all my own coding. I wrote my own functions and everything, did the homework all on my own. It's one of three homework assignments for the entire class and I got a zero on it. And that was enough to drop me from a B to a C, which is not passing in grad school. So don't do that. Even if I should have just turned it in, like I didn't have time to let it run, but here's my code. I probably would have got 50% instead of zero, but that probably would have been enough for me to pass. Don't do what I did. Um, anyway, this whole process, thermodynamics and applying statistics to chemical reactions applies to all chemical reactions. When you apply it to equilibrium constants, you get K, capital K. When you use the same function, and you apply it to rates, you get lowercase k, which has this e, this a term, which is a constant that's unique to all reactions. And then, but then you get this e to the minus delta g double dagger over rt. So in other words, and actually this is really just the delta h, the, the entropy term is folded into this, this a term here, but doesn't really matter. I'm just trying to make the point. It's the same function that we've seen before that gives us this weird, complicated relationship with temperature, which kind of makes sense because look where temperature is in here. You got E, and then in the exponent, you've got a negative, and then an energy that's going to be unique to every reaction. R is a constant, and then T. So you've got a E to the negative one over T relationship. You know, no wonder this comp this function is so complicated looking, right? That's a whole lot going on mathematically. Um, but it does allow us to get that function, that ln of k equals negative delta h over r times 1 over t. That's the lit plus a constant. That's the linear function version of this function right here. You plot a natural log of rate versus one over temperature, you'd get a straight line. All right. How does this apply? Well, understanding just some of the concepts. Um, and I'm going to get away from the term. When we're talking about delta G, I shouldn't be using the term exothermic. Exothermic specifically is talking about delta H. Um, when we're talking about delta G, we actually use the term exergonic, which is why we just say spontaneous or non-spontaneous, because exergonic is just a weird word. Um, but if it's if it's negative delta G, it's called exergonic, but that also just means it's spontaneous, right? Anytime delta G for a reaction is negative, in chemistry terms, we call it spontaneous. Um, and then we, have, we apply the same root. Endergonic means it's non-spontaneous. It's uphill in energy. Delta G is greater than zero. 
This is the real meat and potatoes of this slide though, is that you have two different components of every reaction. You've got delta G for the reaction, and then you've got that double dagger, that transition state energy. And you can have a low transition state energy and have it be spontaneous, means the reaction spontaneous and it'll happen quickly. You can have it be downhill in energy, have it be spontaneous, but also have a huge barrier. That means it's not gonna happen quickly, even though it's spontaneous. That's diamond turning into carbon. We, took, we used that as an example at the very beginning of talking about rates, right? We talked about how diamond turning into graphite is, is a spontaneous process. It's exergonic, but it doesn't happen at normal temperatures because it has a huge barrier, a huge transition state barrier to get there. And then we can have the flip side. We can have a reaction that's uphill in energy, non-spontaneous, but also with a slow, with a low barrier. So delta G being negative, it's spontaneous in terms of equilibrium. If K, if sorry, delta G for the reaction is less than zero. It's a spontaneous reaction. What do we know about K? Just in generic terms. Is it Greater than one, close to one, less than one. Is it a big number or a small number? If it's downhill in energy, it's a spontaneous process. K is products over reactants, right? At equilibrium, we should have more products than reactants, right? So delta G being negative tells us that we'll have, when it reaches equilibrium, what those that ratio will be. The transition state energy tells you how fast it gets to equilibrium. So that's why you can still have, it's a non-spontaneous process if delta G is greater than zero. In other words, at equilibrium, you're gonna favor having more reactants than products. And it'll reach equilibrium quickly if it has a small barrier. And so the whole point I'm trying to drive home with this slide is rate and equilibrium are two different things. Everything always tries to get to equilibrium and how fast it gets to equilibrium is rates, is kinetics. So as long as we're listing off things that affect the rate of reaction, we talked about concentration, we talked about solid and surface area, um, we talked about transition state energy and temperature. The other thing that affects the rate of a reaction, and this goes back to one of the first things I asked you is what happens if you have a system that's already at, at equilibrium and you add in a catalyst. Everybody said nothing happens, right? If you're at equilibrium, adding a catalyst doesn't do anything because a catalyst drops that barrier, it doesn't affect where you start and where you end. Where you start and where you end, that's thermodynamics, that's equilibrium. How fast you get there is governed by that transition state barrier. And that's what a catalyst affects. When you get into enzymes, it's a little bit different because some enzymes actually have a more active effect than just a pure catalyst. Enzyme catalysis is, a, is its own field of study because enzymes are so complicated and some enzymes are actually active reactants. There's a whole process that goes into getting your reactants and binding them to the enzyme. That's its own equilibrium process that has its own rate. So that makes things more complicated. But in general, adding a catalyst is not gonna affect your equilibrium concentrations. And here's why it affects the rate. So we might make it so that it takes two steps now. We have two barriers we have to get through, but both of them are lower than the uncatalyzed case. All right, so adding another pathway can make it easier. So to use an analogy, the altitude analogy again, if I'm trying to get to Sacramento, but I've got a car that can only go up, you know, for 10 minutes before it has to stop or 
falls back down, drive falls back down, you know, in reverse or something like that. I might be able to make it from over Spooner and then Spooner to Reno and then Reno to Sacramento. But I couldn't necessarily go from South Lake Tahoe over Echo. The catalyst is like having that other route. No single step is as high as going from South Lake Tahoe Lake level over Donner, or sorry, over um, Echo. It's a bunch of individual steps that all add up to the same net change, but they all have smaller barriers on their own. It's far from a perfect example, but I think it illustrates what we're what I'm trying to say. It's another route. We can think of these potential energy surfaces, these shapes of these reactions in terms of energy, like a topographical map. And getting from point A to point B, sometimes you can get creative with what route do you take. All right. So if we have multiple step reactions, let me go back for a second. If we have a, a reaction that's not just one clean step from products to reactants or reactants to products, if we have this catalyzed state where we have a couple steps in a row, how do we know what the actual rate law is going to be if we have multiple steps that are each going to all have their own rate? Turns out, go ahead. Take the sum, you're really close. It turns out it's a substitution and it winds up being some, some creative multiplication and substitution, just like we did with Hess's law and just like we did with the half reaction method in K values, right? Putting them together means we might have to do some weirdness with swapping, with doing some substitutions, um, but it's the same net approach. But in general, the slowest step is going to be the step that determines the rate law for the entire process. So um, if we think about, I don't know, um, what's a good analogy this is that everybody has experience with? Um, this is where it's showing that I haven't done this in a while. I keep trying to make a construction analogy. Um, I don't know. So yeah, let's say you're trying to build a house. The slowest part of the house is putting in the baseboards, let's say. It's not, but let's just pretend. <laughs> if everything can be done really, really quickly up to putting in the baseboards, what's going to determine how fast you can build the house? Baseboards, right? How much do you how much baseboard do you have ready? If the person painting the baseboards is going faster than the person putting them in, then you're going to start getting a backlog of baseboards, right? The actual process, the rate of that entire process going to be dependent on that slowest step. And that's what we call the rate limiting step. Right? And, and that's why you can wind up where you can't just look at the stoichiometry for a balanced reaction and guess what the rate law is. Because you don't know if it's a multi-step reaction, what the slowest step is. Whatever the rate limiting step is, it's going to have to involve the two reactants that are in that step running into each other. So it's always going to have, if, if it's a one step reaction, say it's A plus B goes to C. If it's a one step reaction, then A has to run into B. And our rate is going to be dependent on both of these concentrations. Right, more A mean, and means the reaction goes faster, more B means the reaction goes faster. In which case, for a one-step reaction, we could say rate equals constant times A times B. Increasing any of either of those concentrations should speed things up. If it's a two-step reaction, though, then whatever the rate determining step is, the first step might actually be, if it's a two-step reaction, maybe A splits up into two pieces. And that's the slowest step. If the slowest step is A splits into two pieces, it doesn't matter how much B we have. It matters in terms of stoichiometry, but not in terms of rate. 
matters in terms of equilibrium, but not in terms of rate. So this is the whole point I'm trying to make here is this is why equal, the rate loss can't be predicted just by looking at the balanced reaction. We need more information to know what that slowest step is. Um, and this K term, this is the same K that I wrote out earlier as that pre Arrhenius factor. This E sub A is another way of writing the activation energy or the, the transition state energy. Um, specifically looking at the delta H for that step, but it's the general form is this. And I will usually, I'm not going to make you work backwards to figure out um, E sub A, I'll give you, say, your activation energy is this, or I'll have you solve for E sub A, but I'm not going to make a big deal about whether it's delta G or delta H or delta S when it comes to this. The main thing that I want you to understand is this general form of these reactions. And we're going to measure some rates next week and measure a rate constant. And if we measure the rate constant at different temperatures, we can actually figure out what that activation energy is, just like we did for the delta H of the reaction a couple weeks ago. Same process, we just measured the rate several different ways instead of measuring the equilibrium constant several different ways. All right, so how do we actually figure these things out then? We can't just look at the balanced reaction to figure out the rate law. How do we figure out the rate law? Well, this is also somewhat um, glossing over things. Basically, metric reactions or concentrations in real time, you have to get creative. And so a lot of times it's going to depend on what the reaction is. Sometimes there's a color change. Maybe it, um, you could measure the, the absorbance of a specific um, of a specific compound. So remember back to that reaction we used as an example earlier. Hydrogen gas is colorless. Iodine is not. HI is colorless. So you could do something like measure the absorbance at a specific wavelength to figure out what the concentration of iodine is. If you know the concentration of iodine, you can do an ice table to figure out your concentration of product. So basic, a lot of times what we do to actually measure these concentrations is going to be based around what the reaction actually is. Is there something really obvious we could look at here? And in this case, there is. What is it, is there anything that you see in this reaction and something that we've actually worked with quite extensively in this class. How could we measure the concentration of any of these four in real time? Hydration or even just a pH meter, right? You know the pH at a given time, you know the concentration of, of HCl. Because it's a strong acid. So there's a lot of ways we can we can do this, um, but the, the general point is just that we can, as long as we can measure one of these concentrations in real time, we can figure out what the con what the concentration of the rest of them are, and also we can figure out what the rate is. So usually the way we're going to do this is we're going to have point or time one and time two. We're just going to do final minus initial. We're basically going to, just like in, in calculus, if you had a function that looked like this, you've got a changing slope the whole way, but you could estimate the slope between point A and point B by just doing rise over run, right? As long as your change in X is small enough, then that's going to be pretty close to the instantaneous rate pretty close to the slope of that line at any given point. If I actually wanted to know what the tangent was at point A, it's gonna be pretty close to the same slope as just doing finding the average between B and A and just do final minus initial. So that's, that's the way we're going to do this. Okay, well, we have our concentration initial at time equals zero. We have our concentration two at time equals 50. Just do final minus initial and do look at 
your change in rate of uh, concentration divided by your change in T is going to give you your rate for any of those. So basically, we're just relying on the fact that as long as we keep our time window short enough, we don't actually need to do any calculus, which is really nice because these are not nice, clean functions a lot of the time. Um, can you imagine? I mean, I'm sure those of you in calculus, you could tell me what the derivative of that Boltzmann distribution was, but it'd be some nasty chain rule stuff and a whole bunch of constants would wind up showing up, right? As long as we don't have to integrate it. As long as we don't have to integrate it. But well, it's too bad we were talking about the area under the curve. Oh, chill, chill, chill. <laughs> Um, as the rate decreases, the re the react the rate sorry as the reaction progresses, the rate decreases, which we talked about that process so already. Um, what I really want to get to is how do we figure out what the rate law is. Um, this is stuff that we that we looked at. If you want more information about that tangent lines, um, you can come back to this. This is the one I want to look at. All right, so here, this is a really common way of figuring out what that rate law is. In other words, what are the exponents on those um, on those reactants? We've got a reaction here, ammonia plus nitrite reacts to form nitrogen gas and water. And we, we're interested in the rate of this reaction. We know that all rates, all chemical reactions, follow the same general form. It's always rate is equal to K times concentration of reactant one to an exponent and times concentration of reaction two to an exponent. But the only thing we don't know, K we can actually figure out, if we know what the rate is, we can figure out K pretty easily if we know what these two concentrations are too, right? If we have any one point, we can figure out what K is, is at this specific temperature. Because if we know, okay, our initial concentration of ammonium is this, our initial concentration of nitride is this, here's our initial rate, which is just from final minus initial divided by change in time. Figuring out X and Y, is a little bit trickier, but we can usually assume that they're integers for now. That doesn't hold up when you get into biochem because enzymes are weird, like I said. But for now, we can assume that X and Y are either going to be 0, 1, or 2. There might be a third order reaction somewhere out there, but in general, things are going to be 0 order, first order, second order. So from this information, we actually have everything we need. This is actually more information than we need. It's a series of reactions that are done where they basically said, okay, we're going to do experiment one. We're just going to put some ammonium and some nitride together, and we're going to get a, a baseline rate. And then we're going to do the same experiment, except, and we're going to keep the temperature the same. We're going to keep our nitrite concentration the same, but we're going to double our ammonium concentration. So if our three options for, so basically what we're trying to figure out here is X, what effect does changing ammonium have on the rate? If X is zero, what effect is changing the concentration gonna have? None. So if it's zero order in ammonium, when we double this concentration, we should see the rate stay the same. But that's not what we see, is it? So we know it's not zero. If X is one and we double our concentration, what should the rate do? Also double, right? If we plugged, if X is one and we plug two X, sorry, not, I'll stop using X. If we double the concentration, we said, two times NH4 initial to the one, we're just gonna get a random times two term show up, right? 
versus if we if x is two and we plug it plug that in, we're going to end up with a four times term show up, right? You double the concentration in its second order, the rate should go up by a factor of four. So for this reaction, let me clean this up a little. We, when we compare it, the trick with these, we're always comparing the different rows to each other. What changed and what effect did that have on the rate? From going from experiment one to experiment two, you double the ammonium concentration, the rate double. We don't even need a calculator to see that, right? Went from 5.4, and they do the favor in this case of putting all of these in the same, um, the same power of 10. So we can see that it's twice 5.4, 10.8. So what is X? One. X is one. How do we figure out why? Change. Yeah, we look at one at a set of experiments where we're keeping um, ammonium constants, and we're changing, we're doubling our nitrite concentration. So for this one, we're doubling our nitrite concentration. Our rate also doubles. So is Y zero, one, or two? One. Also one. So our our final rate con our rate law for this reaction is rate equals K times ammonium concentration to the one times nitrite concentration to the one. That tells us everything we need to know to figure out the rate at any given point. As long as we know what our concentration of these are, we know what the exponent is, and k is a constant, as long as we're staying at the same temperature, then we can assume that k is the same for all of these. And once you know what x and y are, you can just plug in, pick one row, any one row here, and plug in everything except for k, and you can solve for k. And right, so this is what's called the method of initial rates. You bury the concent the initial concentrations, you watch what happens to the initial rate, and that's everything you need if you do it right. That's everything you need to get the rate law for that reaction, because every reaction has its own rate law. They all have the same general form, but K is going to be different for each one of them, at every different temperature, and X and Y are going to be different for every reaction. All right, we're over. So we're gonna start with this one on Thursday. Still